Shall we rise up to pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. Thank you for those who are brought for the first time. And thank you for those who have just started coming. We thank you, Lord, for the people who have just come to know the Lord and they want to be strengthened by the study of your word. We are praying, Lord, that tonight you open the eyes of everyone to see wondrous, glorious things out of your word in Jesus' name. We are praying, Lord, for those who have been coming for a long time and for those who are just coming, that all of us together, new and old and young and old, you bless us in the study of your word in Jesus' name. We pray that you grant us a key of understanding and grant us the wisdom and the revelation so that, Lord, everything you are revealing from your word will account to receive and understand and be able to stand upon and observe in Jesus' name. Bless us together here and then all those who are listening and watching, we pray everywhere within Nigeria and outside Nigeria and Africa and outside. Bless everyone in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. You can be seated. I welcome every one of us to the Bible study today, especially those who are coming from the crusade. You've just come to know the Lord. When you study the Bible, it gives you a backbone, makes you strong, and makes you to be able to face all the challenges you need to face. That's what has kept the rest of us who have known the Lord for such a long time. Some of us have known the Lord for a few years and even more. And it is the study of the word of God regularly that has made us strong in the ways of the Lord. And because we're strong, we're able to stand whatever challenges and whatever storms or whatever wind may blow. That's why we encourage you that as you have just started coming to the Bible study, make each a regular thing, a weekly thing. Because it's very important, essential. It's a very focus and a pivot of the lives of the people that really know the Lord. You study the word of God. You study it personally. You wake up in the morning. You take the Bible. You take the word of God and study it. And go through verse by verse. And uh, you'll find if you're using the Deeper Life uh, calendar that we have the passages to read there. Not only that, if you have a study scripture, it will show you where to read every time. And when you read that, you study that, you take it in. And it's going to fill you with the strength of the Lord, the power of the Lord, and the grace of God. And for those of us who have been coming for a long time, don't take the Bible for granted. Don't take the word of God for granted. Study it. Read it. Understand it, apply it to your life, and as you do, you'll be the stronger in Jesus' name. Well, now in Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, you remember, we studied already, verses 1 through to 10. In verses 1 through to 10, we learned last week about the hallelujah, the glory to God, the honor to God, the praise of the Lord. Why were the people in heaven praising the Lord? Because the marriage of the supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb had come. You go back to chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed, she should be clothed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. That talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Actually, as we've been studying the Bible, those who have been coming for a long time, you know that the great tribulation is about coming to an end. And as the great tribulation is coming to an end, you see the things that are happening. Between the time of the rapture and the time of the return of Christ, you find this, Lord, this supper. That is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And after that marriage supper of the Lamb, then you are going to find some events happening to you. And that's where we are now reading from verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, the white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness does judge and make war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. In verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, and clothed 
they were clothed in fine linen, clean and white. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. That was it. It shall smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh. A name reaching, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped the his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. In that passage I've read to you, we are being shown, we are being re it's been revealed to us about the coming of the Lord. Actually, there are two events you'll find in that place I've read to you. Number one, the second coming of Christ. The Christ who came before and died on the cross is coming again and is coming to reign. But then, apart from the second coming of the Lord, you have what is called the Battle of Armageddon. There's going to be a serious war. And the Lord Jesus Christ is going to fight against the beast, that is the representation of the Antichrist, and the false prophets supporting the Antichrist. And eventually, as you find in the end of that chapter, they were cast into the lake of fire. But let's begin at the beginning, talking about the second coming of Christ. You see, in verse 11, it says, And I saw heaven opened. And behold, the white horse, and he that sat on him was called the faithful and the true. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. We need to understand that just as Jesus came to us the first time, so he is coming again. He will return at the end of the great tribulation. Jesus Christ, who came the first time as a lamb of God, will come the second time as the lion of the tribe of Judah. You'll find as you look about as you look at Jesus Christ, he came the first time as a servant, he's going to come back as a king. He came the first time as a sacrifice, he's going to come back again as a sovereign king, the sovereign lord, the sovereign master. He came the first time to suffer. He's coming the next time to reign and to enjoy, to be exalted. He came the first time. He was humiliated. He's coming the second time and he's going to be honored, glorified, and exalted. He came the first time rejected by a tiny nation, Israel. He's coming the second time, not just a tiny nation. He's go going to come and he's going to reign over all the nations of the earth. He came the first time and people saw him as ordinary man, having no form or comeliness that we should desire him. But he's going to come the next time with glory and power coming in the clouds. The second coming of Christ is going to be vastly different, terribly different, completely different from the first coming of the Lord. He came then for sacrifice, the Lamb of God. is coming again to rule and to reign as a lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming in flaming fire. And he will come with all the saints to execute judgment on the earth and to reign as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The second coming of Christ actually is the focal point of the book of Revelation. You'll find in the, at the very beginning of this uh, book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 1, I'm looking at verse 3. Revelation chapter 1, reading from verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, that they, may, that, uh, they, and they that hear the words of the prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Right at the beginning of the book, it tells us the time is at hand. The question is, what time? What time is he talking about? In verse 7, behold, the comet were the clouds. The time of his coming is very, very near at hand. 
And so you find the very focus of this book of Revelation is talking about the coming of the Lord. And then you, you look at chapter 2 and it, it tells us in verse 25, Be, But that which ye have already hold fast till I come. You can't miss it if you go through the book of Revelation. That the coming of the Lord is the very center. It's a very emphasis. And it's a very focus. And as I say, we're reminded of over and over. Chapter 3, verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. The coming of the Lord then is so essential, so very important. And it's a pivotal, pivotal point, And it's a vocal point, And it is the thing that the word of God is telling us. Revelation is saying he'll be revealed. He'll be revealed as a coming king. And he will come in the clouds. And because he's coming, that's the reason why everyone ought to be prepared. In Revelation chapter 16 verse 15. Behold, I come as a see. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. Lest they walk naked and they see shame. It tells us at the beginning, and then as he goes into the middle of the book, it still reminds us again, it says, don't forget. You may read about a lot of things in the book of Revelation, about the great tribulation, and about the calamities that will come upon the people of the world at that time. But do not forget, from the very beginning to the end, he's talking about, I'm coming again, I'm coming again. And then before the book closes, actually, he tells us in Revelation chapter 22, and in verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. It tells us again, yes, I'm coming, I'm coming. I have not forgotten my promise, I have not forgotten the prophecy. It's going to be fulfilled in verse 12 of that same chapter. Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And then in verse 20, he would testify these things, say, surely I come quickly, amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And you'll see very clearly then, as you look at the book of Revelation, is talking about the coming of the Lord. And everything is pointing to the fact that he is coming. And then as we are coming to the end of the book, and the events are spinning up, and they are following one another in rapid succession. It's telling us, it's coming again, it's coming again. And as you think about the second coming of the Lord, what's he coming to do? And the second coming of the Lord is going to reclaim the world. Which world? The world ruined by sinners and ruled by Satan. He will come to reclaim and renew that, that world as a sovereign Lord. The return of Christ to this earth is a constant theme of scripture. Bible scholars who have specially studied the coming of the Lord from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, they have told us that you have 1845 references in the whole Bible referring to the second coming of Christ. When you think about a subject of scripture, a subject, a doctrine that is so important that the Bible refers to it in 1845, that is 1,845 references of the Bible, that must be mightily important. And in the New Testament alone, you have 318 references to the second coming of the Lord. Not less than 17 Old Testament books emphasize its return. Is coming again. And while in the New Testament, seven out of every ten chapters, that 70% of the chapters of the New Testament refer to this as shattering event. He's coming again. He's coming again. He's so very sure. And if you look at the regular hymn books of, of the church, you'll find it also occupies a conspicuous place. That's why the songwriter is saying, lift up your heads. Ye pilgrims are weary. See the days approach, approach. Now crimson the sky. The night shadows flee. And your beloved, that is the Lord, the bridegroom, I waited for a long time. At last it draws near. Dark was the night. Sin warred against us. Heavy the load of sorrow we bore. But now we see the signs of his coming. Our hearts glow within us. The joy's cup runneth over. O blessed hope. O blissful promise. Filling our hearts with rapture divine. O, o day of days. Hail thy appearing. Thy transcendent glory forever shall shine. Even so come. Precious Lord Jesus. Creation waits redemption to see. Cut up in the cloud soon shall we meet thee. O blessed assurance forever will be with thee. Is coming again, is coming again. Yes, that very same Jesus rejected of men is coming again, is coming again with power, with great glory. 
He is coming again. The Savior, yes. That same one that died on the cross and suffered for, our law, for, for, for the laws. And of heavenly glory to die on the cross. The babe of manger. Though born without stain. Jesus, that same Jesus is coming. is coming again. The angels are rejoicing and singing his praise. To Bethlehem shepherds of earlier days will come in glory attending his train. When Jesus my Savior is coming again. The saints will be with him. O oh, heavenly bliss, how cheerful the parting from faces will meet. But clouds are descending and we remain. Are cut, we that we remain are cut out to meet them with, with Jesus again. O oh, hearts that are weary and sinful and sad. We carry the tidings that make us so glad. We publish the Savior over mountain and plain. The Lord who redeemed us is coming again. Jesus is coming, is coming, is coming. Jesus is coming again, my heart heart is so happy my soul is so glad for jesus is coming again we we'll preach it, we we'll sing it, we we'll pray about it, we we'll look for it, and, and we're we'll longing that Jesus Christ is coming. Then all tears will be wiped away, and the joy of the people of God will be fulfilled. As we talk about the coming of the Lord, we need to understand number one is coming for the church. Number two is coming to the world. It's coming the, for the church. That's what we call the rapture. When the people of God are taken away out of this world, behold, I show you a mystery. And we shall not all die. In a twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. And then we are caught out to be with the Lord. That's the rapture. And then there is the second coming of the Lord. And many people do not understand and therefore they mistake the rapture for the return of the Lord. For the second coming of Christ. But those two events are actually separate. And they are distinct, separated from one another. What are the differences? Number one, at the time of the rapture, Christ Christ comes for his saints. He comes for us. And the dead are raised. And those who are alive, they are caught up to be with him in the air. But at the second coming, he'll be coming with the saints out of heaven. You know the difference there? The saints were on earth at the rapture. And then Jesus came from the skies. And he doesn't touch the ground. But he, cut, he catches us up. He comes for us. Whereas at the time of the second coming, the saints are coming from heaven. And they're coming with the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're coming to rule and to reign on this earth. Number two, he comes in the air at the time of the rapture. And then at the time of the second coming, he comes actually and his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. Number three, when he comes in the rapture, that's a great blessing. That's a great blessing for the people of God. Therefore, comfort you one another with these words. It's a message of comfort, the rapture. It's a message of blessing, the rapture. But at the second coming, is coming to judge. And because he's coming to judge the world, that's why it says the people, they tremble before him. And they will mourn before him at his second coming. There is no mourning for the sins of God, for the people of God, for the children of God at the time of the rapture. But at the time of the return of the Lord, the second coming, there's going to be mourning in the hearts of those people that are not ready for him. And then not only that, the rapture takes place at the beginning of the great tribulation, whereas the second coming will be taking place at the end of the great tribulation. Actually, those two events, the rapture and the return, are separated by seven years. They're seven years apart. And that's what we're looking at today. Together with the things that will attend the coming of the Lord when he comes again. We're dividing the study to three parts. Number one, the second coming and the attributes of Christ, the conqueror. The second coming and the attributes of Christ the conqueror. Number two, the saintly company of the armies of Christ the conqueror. That is, the company of saints, the army of saints that will come with him when he comes again. Number three, the severe condemnation of the adversaries of Christ the conqueror. The people that oppose the Lord, the people that will fight against him, the people that will resist his coming, and the people that will resist his reign, his rule, or the rod of iron, is going to conquer them. And it's going to be condemnation, destruction for them, severe condemnation of the adversaries of Christ the conqueror. We'll come back to number one, the second coming. And the attributes of Christ the conqueror. Please uh, read your Bible and look at it in um, Revelation chapter 19 from verse 11. And I saw heaven opened. Behold the white horse. 
and he that sat upon him was was called faithful and true and in righteousness he does judge and make war his eyes was a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name reaching that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of god you, you you see here it says and i saw heaven opened do you remember the first time we saw something like that heaven opened turn your bible to revelation chapter 4 verse 1 heaven opening and then here we're, we're coming down it says in chapter 4 verse 1 after this i looked and behold a door was opened in heaven i need to remind you that that was at the time of the rapture because you have the story of the church the period of the church in chapters 2 and 3. And now that we're finished with the story and the period of the church, the church is taken away. And heaven is ready to receive the church at the rapture. And so you find in chapter 4 verse 1, heaven opened for the rapture. And now we've been in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ, celebrating and singing and rejoicing all this while that the great tribulation was taking place on the earth. And now again we're ready to come back with the Lord Jesus Christ, the bridegroom and the bride. The captain and his army. The conqueror and his conquering army with him. The one that sits on the white horse. And the ones, the plural, the saints that sit on white horses. Coming back with him because they have got the victory. And then the heaven, open, heaven opens again to allow us to come down. That's why it says in that chapter 19 verse 11. And I saw heaven open. And behold the white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true. The identity of the one sitting on that white horse is revealed unto us. Is the faithful one. Is the true one. And as referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll show you references that tell us that he is a faithful one. He is a true one. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. That means when he comes this time, heaven is opened. He's sitting on the white horse. The white horse is showing the victory. It's showing the glory. It's showing the resplendent beauty that he had. Because now he's not, he's, he's not coming to sacrifice again. He's coming to reign. And therefore he comes in victory. He comes as a conqueror. And then we're told that he's a faithful one. And he comes to judge and to make war. Uh, we, we, we went up in the rapture. And we're going to return with Christ. When he comes again, Christ's second coming will be visible. Heaven will, the heavens will open. And then he'll come visibly in a, in a white, on a white horse. And then we're told it will be majestic and glorious. At the first coming, he came in humility to die for us and to save all who believe. At the second coming, he is coming in power to judge the world and to reign as king. Uh, you, you see when it says, it's, uh, he that sat on him, the faithful and the true. Here Christ is presented as coming out of an open heaven in a picture of final glory and ultimate triumph. He that is faithful and true. Let's look at the Bible, at the word of God. And we're looking at Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 3 verse 14. Revelation chapter 3, looking at verse 14. The description of the Lord. The identification mark of the Lord. The attribute of the Lord himself. That is faithful and true. It's true and faithful. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. These are the, these are the, uh, these things says the amen. The faithful and the true witness. That's he. That's Christ. That's the coming one. That's the conquering one. He is coming. He is a faithful and the true. And then we we're told in Revelation chapter 1, reading from verse 7. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Behold, he cometh with the clouds. And every eye shall see him. And he also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the eye shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. We're told in verse 12 of that same chapter 1. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. Being turned, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a white, clothed with a garment down to his foot, and girt about with paths with a golden girdle. His head and his ears were white like wool, the ancient of days, as white as snow, pure, 
spotless, sinless. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Do you remember chapter 19 where we just read now in verse 12? His eyes as a flame of fire. And in this chapter 1, it tells us the same thing, the same description, that his eyes were just like flames of fire. And then he tells us in verse 15, chapter 1, his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burnt in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shined in his train. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his hand, his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, the identity or identification of the Lord Jesus Christ is the one we have read about in chapter 19. When the heavens op when the heaven opened, and then someone appeared in on a white horse. And his name is faithful. His name, his attribute is true. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. He does judge and make war. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, there are people that have not followed his precept. There are people that have not followed his offer. There are people that have not received his grace. There are people that have neglected his warning. And then judgment will come upon them. And he's going to be faithful to the warning that he gave out before. That if they didn't repent, he was going to judge them. You look at Revelation chapter 2 reading from verse 18. Revelation chapter 2 verse 18 And unto the angel of the church Unto the leader, unto the pastor Unto the elder of the Of the church of Titara Write these things says the son Of God who has his eyes Like unto a flame of fire And his feet like fine brass I know thy works And charity and service and faith And patience and thy works And the last to be more than The first if that were the end, that would have been great. If all that Jesus said in verse 19 concerning this pastor, this leader, this worker, it would have been great. But Jesus said more. Because in verse 20, it says, Notwithstanding, beyond all those things, uh, the qualities you have, and beyond everything I've mentioned, there's still something that I need to talk about. I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest to permit to allow that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to, to, to commit adultery and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. And she repented not. That's why Jesus Christ will be coming back again. And he'll be the faithful one, the true one. He'll be true to everything he said before. If he gave out any promise, he'll be true to it. If he gave out any threat, he'll be true to it. If he gave out any warning, he'll be true to it. That's why over here it said, I gave her space to repent of her fornication. And she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. And them that commit adultery were sent into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill our children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the rains on their hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. And so you find when it says that Jesus Christ is coming again. And we're told that in righteousness, he does judge and he does make war. And we're told then that there's going to be judgment. Let's read about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're coming back now to Revelation chapter 19. In verse 12 it says, His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew. But he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. He is vesture. That he is his clothing. It's like it was totally crimson and red, as if it was dipped in blood. How about that? In Isaiah chapter 63, I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 63, reading from verse 1. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is this? That cometh from Edom, died with dyed garments from Bosra. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. But you know that before he could save us, he had to die on the cross. 
And because he died on the cross, then he shed his blood as wine. All this blood spilled over. And as the armies of heaven saw him, and as the redeemed on earth, as it seemed, it's like everywhere was covered with blood. In verse, in verse 2, wherefore art thou red in thy apparel? And thy garments like him that treadest in the wine, in the wine fart. I have trodden in the winepress alone. And of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. Their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. This another, is this another picture. He came as a savior. That's what you'll find in verse 1. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore are thou read in thine apparel? Uh, you see, when Jesus Christ died, he shed his blood. And the blood from the head, the blood from the hand, the blood from the side, and the blood from the feet. Or literally, his whole blood came out for the salvation of humanity. But then he's coming to tread upon the sinners, the unrepentant ones, the unyielding ones. And the people that are impenitent, adamant in their sin. And then it will be like their blood will spill upon his garments. That's what we are told in verse 3. In verse 4, for the day of vengeance is in mine heart. And the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked and there was none to help. And I wondered there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me. And my fury. And it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger. And make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. And on the one hand there is mercy. But those who reject mercy will have judgment. On the one hand there is grace. But the people that reject grace will have the fury and the wrath of the Lord. On the one hand there is love. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But to those who reject that love will face the condemnation, the damnation of the lost. I pray you will not reject. That you receive the love of God and that love of God will make the blood of Jesus efficacious for you. Wash your sin, cleanse your sin, put your heart and make you a real child of God. In Isaiah chapter 64, in verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 64, verses 1 and 2. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest calm down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence, as when the melting fire burneth. The fire causes the waters to boil, and to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. That is, the nations of the people that reject the Lord, they will tremble. While the believers are rejoicing, while the believers are celebrating, while the believers are having a jubilee, then the unbelievers will be having judgment, and they will tremble at the sight of the Lord. In Zechariah chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 1. Zechariah chapter 14. I'm reading to you there from verse 1. In Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1, here we find the declaration of the word of God again, talking about the time when that judgment will come. About the time when the Lord Jesus Christ will come and will judge the people of the world, of the nations, and righteousness. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. And thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the house is rifled. And the women ravished. And the half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. That's talking about the coming of the Lord. He will come. We've read about it already. That white horse coming out of heaven. And he who is riding on that horse, the faithful and the true. The one who comes out of heaven and he judges in righteousness. He makes war against his adversaries in righteousness. When he comes that second time, his feet shall stand. In that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and 
half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains. And for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Hosea the king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come. And all the saints of thee, the Lord my God shall come. He's coming again. And the saints will come with him. That is, the armies of heaven will come with him. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. But it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord. Not day, not night, but it shall come to pass that at evening, at, at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea in summer and in winter shall it be and the Lord shall be king over all the earth that's why it says he's coming as the king of kings and the Lord of lords the Lord Jesus Christ our redeemer our savior the conquering one the one that will come to rule and to reign the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day shall there be one Lord and his name one actually Jesus Christ himself even spoke about that when he was here on earth when he was having the Mount Olivet discourse uh, talking to his own disciples about his coming again he spoke about his coming and they were told in matthew chapter 24 verse 29 matthew chapter 24 verse 29 immediately after the tribulation of those days you see that the lord jesus christ will come he'll return after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of, he of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. When he comes, he's coming to reign. He's not coming to, you know, to die, to be humble, to be in humiliation, to be tortured, and to be crucified like they did the first time. He's coming to reign. Even the prophets of the Old Testament knew that Jesus will come two times. He'll come first of all to Bethlehem. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And then they knew that he'll be coming again to reign, and the kingdom shall be upon his shoulder. It tells us in Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. I saw in the night, in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. It's coming with the clouds, and it's coming with glory. It's coming in power. It came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory, and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that we shall not be destroyed. Here we learn, as we have learned in many other places, that Jesus Christ is coming again when he comes. He's coming to judge the world. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, we're, we're reading from verse 13. What's to be our response now? What's to be our attitude now? What's to be our reaction now? Knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. What should we do? We're told in Acts chapter 17 verse 30. And in times of this ignorance, God went out. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. It tells us that because the Lord is coming. And because the time is now at hand. And the period when the people of the world can just do whatever they like. At the time they like to do it, that period is coming to an end. The rapture will soon take place. And then after the rapture, the great tribulation. And then at the end of that seven-year period of the great tribulation will be the coming of the Lord when he comes in righteousness. And he comes to judge. And he comes to make war with the rebels of the land. And because of that, in view of that, the Lord now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. To repent means to turn away from sin. To repent means to turn away from Satan. To repent means, it means to turn away from self. And when you turn away from sin, from Satan, from self, and then you're holding on to the Savior as the all in all in your life, as the one to now control your life, the master and the Lord of your life. That means you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and how grateful we are to God and how happy we are as we rejoice with those that just did that. And if you have not done that, you are hearing the teaching today. The Lord is saying before it becomes too late, repent. He commands all men everywhere, in every nation, to repent. Because in verse 31, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. That by that man whom he has ordained whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. And uh, that's the reason why we're saying if you have not uh, given your life to the Lord, this is the time that you repent and turn away from your sin and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. And we're told as we we'll come back to Revelation chapter 19 of the description of the Lord, the attribute of the Lord, the characteristics of the Lord, the name of the Lord. It tells us in verse 13, and he, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. His name is called the Word of God. I'm sure you remember that John is the one that received this revelation. And uh, John, uh, to John, this was a confirmation, a confirmation of what he knew before. In John chapter 1, that Jesus Christ is the Word of God. John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's Jesus Christ, that's his name. The Word was God. In verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. And dwelt among us. That's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And as he writes his epistle, he, he reminds us again that Jesus Christ is that word. It's the very word of God in First John chapter 1. First John chapter 1, reading verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard and which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. And for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was for the Father, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with the Son, Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as the Word of God. That's his peculiar name. That name belongs to him alone. All these names and attributes speak of our Lord's glory and honor and exaltation. He is the Son of God, the conquering, reigning Lord and King. Welcome to point number two. We're looking at now the saintly company of the armies of Christ, the conqueror. That is the army that came with him out of heaven as he comes back in the clouds. We're looking at Revelation chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 14. Revelation chapter 19, reading from verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Clothes, a fine linen, white and clean. And here we're told the armies followed him out of heaven. And the question is, who are these that followed him out of heaven? Well, the one way you can identify them is by their clothing. Because it says they are clothed in fine linen, white and clean. In this chapter, we just learned it about that. As you look at Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. And look at the wife in verse 8. It says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, cleaner and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Who are these then that came with the Lord Jesus Christ? That's his bride. That's the church. Those are the people of God. Those are the people who are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Those are the people whose sins have been forgiven. Those are the people who are not continuing in sin anymore. Those are the people who have been a change of life, a transformation of life. Those are the people that now they have the righteousness of the sins because they have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's the army that came from heaven with him. As you look at Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7, and you will see these people in verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? 
And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Those are the people, people that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And because they have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, that means their lives have become different. Totally different. Because they gave their lives to the Lord, their sins were forgiven, and the blood of Jesus cleansed them. And it says the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 4. There was a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. They shall walk with me in white because they are worthy. These are the children of God. I will come back to Revelation chapter 19 verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in white linen, in fine linen, clean, white and clean. The children of God following him, following him from heaven. Uh, actually, as you think about uh, what Jude had written, if you look at Jude, you'll say that you'll see that Jude had prophesied about this. Uh, in fact, uh, Jude was even quoting Enoch. It tells us in Jude verse fourteen. Jude verse fourteen, and Enoch also, the servants from Adam prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Do you see that? With ten thousands of his saints. So these ones that are coming with the Lord Jesus Christ out of heaven, they are the saints of God. But it says ten thousands. You're asking me, isn't it? Uh, uh, are not the saints of God, the children of God, from the beginning of the world to the time of the rapture? Are they not more than ten thousand? Yes, they are more than ten thousand. Why then does it say, Behold, the Lord come with ten thousands of his saints? You need to understand that the New Testament was written in Greek. And at that time, when the writing of the New Testament was done, the highest number was ten thousand. And just like today, now you can talk of a hundred, you talk of a thousand, you talk of a million, you talk of a billion, then you're talking of trillions. And then after trillions, what are you going to say? And therefore, you just say trillions and trillions of people. And in their own time, they didn't have any number that will, be, that will go beyond 10,000. That was the highest numeral. And therefore, they just said 10,000. It's like today, we're saying trillions. And so it says, behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000, so the highest number, and multiples of that highest number of the saints. And when it comes, what's he going to do in verse 15? To execute judgment upon all. And to convince all that are ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. And of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He's coming and when he comes, he's coming to judge. And let's read those other verses here, verses 15 and 16 of Revelation chapter 19. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with each he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his tie a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And as the Lord Jesus Christ, we're told that the heavenly saints, the heavenly host of saints who had been raptured and closed in righteousness, that they will follow him. These souls of redeemed raptured saints on white horses that symbolize in their victory accompany the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth at his coming to witness his victory and to participate in the joy of his triumph. As I read to you in Jude that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming and is coming with ten thousands of saints to execute judgment upon all. Immediately after the marriage supper of the Lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ will appear in glory with his angelic host and with his saints. And out of his mouth, as we have just read now, will proceed a sharp sword and will do three things. Number one, it will smite the nation. He'll smite the people that do not, do not love him, do not accept him, do not receive his grace and mercy and love. Number two, he will rule them with a rod of iron. Number three, he will tread the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the almighty God. 
It does not even need to strike them at all because only his word, when it says a sharp sword coming out of his mouth, is, you know, if you are going to hold a literal sword, you'll be holding it with your hand. But when he talks about the sword, the sharp sword that is coming out of his mouth, he's talking about the word, the word of his power. Do you remember? Even when he was still here on earth, and the persecutors and the people that wanted to crucify him, and they came to him, and they said they are looking for Jesus, and they came with clubs in their hand, and he said, who are you looking for? Then they said, we're looking for Jesus. Then he looked at them straight in the face and said, I am he. And they all fell to the ground. If that happened at the time of his humiliation, what will happen? At the time of his exaltation, when he comes in power, when he comes in great glory, and then he comes to fight deliberately with the people that reject him. We're told in uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart so the sword that is coming out of his out of his mouth is not is nothing else but the word of god the word of power the word of authority with which is going to smite and strike all those people now the word is a sword and the word that is coming out of his mouth will be so powerful and mighty it will destroy in a single statement of authority authority all those people that are against him and as we look at uh, ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god the sword is the word and it comes out of his mouth and it strikes them down and uh, there is uh, there is power that cannot be limited even in his voice when he speaks the day against all all those opposers, the nations who are opposed to him, who worship the beast, who worship the antichrist, who follow the false prophet, will be judged and they'll be trodden down under the fierce wrath of the almighty God. And let's look at some references of the Bible to uh, support all those things that we have read about in Revelation chapter 19. In Isaiah chapter 66, Isaiah Chapter 66, reading from verse 15 and verse 16. Isaiah 66, verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. That is when those people confront the Lord and they fight against the Lord. And then the Lord fights against them or the word of his mouth. And then his fire will come and devour them and destroy them. And the slain of the Lord, those who will be under the judgment of God, those who oppose the Lord and therefore they are destroyed. By that judgment of the Lord, there will be very, very many. The slain of the Lord will be many. Because they will not just be in one village or in one town, in one city or just in one country. In many nations of the world and of many languages and many tongues and many people that will reject the love of God, that will reject the mercy of God, that will reject the grace of God and then Christ comes and I, as he wants to come and he says, no, you are not going to rule over us. We're going to be who we are and we're going to keep on our rebellion and then he fights against them and he brings fire upon them and the word of power, the word of authority will destroy many Many of them and many of them will lose their lives and when they die here then they go to eternal hell fire we're told in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 4 Isaiah chapter 11 reading from verse 4 but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity the, for the meek of the earth and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked again he's telling us that the people that reject the love of God those who reject the grace of God those who reject the mercy of God they're the wicked people they reject mercy. They say, no, we don't want mercy. We want to continue in our sin, in our evil. We want to continue following after sin, after Satan, after self. And therefore, he smites them with the breath of his lips. It tells us in Joel chapter 3. I'm reading to you from verse 12 there. In Joel, Joel chapter 3. And we're looking at it from verse 12. Joel chapter 3, verse 12. 
Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I seek to judge all the heathen round about. These are pagans. These are heathens. These are unbelievers. These are sinners. These are the people that keep on following. They are depravity. And they will not come to know the Lord. The mercy of the Lord has been presented to them. Joel has spoken to them in chapter 2. Rend your heart and not your clothes. And turn away from your sin. But no, they refuse to the very end. And so he says, okay, then you can come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Because there I'm going to see to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle. For the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down. For the press is full and the fats overflow. For the wickedness is great. More teachers, more teachers in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened. And the stars shall withhold their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. It's telling us again of that time when the judgment will come. A devastating judgment. Calamity coming upon the people. When the Lord comes, it will be a time of terror for the unbelievers. But a time of joy for the people of God. Uh, for the people of God. Because as we're looking at the night of judgment. We ought to also understand the day of the appearing of the Lord for his own people had been there. And then we're praising the Lord because we're partakers of his glory. And partakers of his joy. And partakers of his, of his victory. Because we are white horses coming back uh, from heaven and wanting to view wanting to see how the Lord will destroy the rebels altogether we're told in Colossians chapter 3 Colossians chapter 3 reading from verse 1 if ye then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ seated on the right hand of God set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth for ye are dead and your life is sealed with Christ in God when Christ who is our life, talking to believers now, children of God, Christ who is our life, he lives within us. And because he lives, we live. And because his reasons, that's why we're risen. We're risen with Christ. And because his righteousness, why? He has given us his righteousness. And then he has taken us to heaven. By this time we're studying in Revelation chapter 19. And then we're coming back, we're seeing when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. We appear with him in glory. But for the people of the world, what a day of mourning, and what a day of calamity, and what a day of suffering, what a day of sorrow, what a day of judgment it will be for them. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 again. Matthew 25, we're looking at verse 31. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in glory, and all his, all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of glory. He'll sit upon the throne of glory, and in verse 31 before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as the shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. There'll be the goats, the rebellion, the rebellious ones. There'll be the goats, the unrepentant ones. There'll be the goats, the uh, the ones that remain adamant in their sin, and then the judgment will come upon them. Revelation tells us about uh, his uh, fierceness when he comes, because he'll not be the humble savior. He'll, he'll not be the pleading one. He'll not be the one that's saying, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. That's a time of grace. That's a time of love and a time of mercy, which the people have rejected. And then they've rejected the very last moment or the very last hour of the coming of the Lord. And now there's going to be fury. There's going to be judgment coming upon then it tells us in Revelation chapter 1 verse 16 Revelation chapter 1 verse 16 and he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength his countenance will be so bright actually so dazzling that the unbelievers will not be able to stand they will not be able to bear the glory of his appearance because his coming. The glory is not to make them glorious. The glory is to show his power that's able to judge them and destroy the wicked ones. Revelation chapter 2 verse 16. 
In Revelation chapter 2, verse 16, here again, we're to repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against thee with the sword of my mouth. There was a time when his words were comforting. That's the time of his earthly ministry. That's the time of grace. That's the time of the love and the mercy of God. That's the time when, the, when his word brought healing. But at this time, his word, that's the time of judgment. That, that, same, that same Christ will speak with what's bringing judgment and destruction and devastation upon the people that have rejected grace. And a day of grace for them is forever past. In Revelation chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 15. Revelation 11, reading from verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. All the kingdoms of all the nations of the world. There is a time is coming when all those kingdoms will become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ and will become the kingdom of the reigning Christ, the reigning king, the king of kings and the lord of lords. And then we're told, he shall reign forever and ever. His dominion shall know no end. His kingdom shall never be terminated, shall never be destroyed, but is going to reign forever and ever. He tells us in the following verse, in verse 16, and the four and the twenty elders which sat before God on their, on their seats, fell upon their faces and they worship God saying we give these thanks O Lord God Almighty which art and was and art to come because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned there is no doubt about the reigning of Christ there's no doubt that Jesus Christ is going to come in glory is going to come in power and the four and the twenty elders symbolizing representing the church the redeemed ones we studied that before they will they will fall down from their seats and they fall on their faces to worship the Lord saying we give this thanks O Lord God Almighty you are you are and you are to come because you have taken to yourself your great power and you have reigned and then he tells us in verse 18 that the nations were angry and thy wrath is come and the time that the dead of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest reward give reward to thy servants the prophets and to the saints and to them that fear thy name small and great and should destroy them we destroy the earth you see in that verse 18 we've studied that before what the lord will do many many things there number one because those angry nations have not submitted to the lord then the wrath will come upon them and then the Lord will judge them. But not only that, that's the time when the Lord will look at the faithful servants. As a faithful people, the faithful followers of Christ. And they will reward his saints and his servants, the prophets of God. And then we're told that the people that fear the name of the Lord, small and great, young and old, the Lord will also reward them. But then we're told in the latter part of that verse 18, and shouldest destroy them that destroy the earth. Uh, the Lord is coming. Judgment is coming. All will be there. Those who have rejected, those who have spawned, those who have said, no, we don't want the Lord. We want to continue in our sin. Judgment will come upon them. Revelation chapter 17 verse 14. In Revelation chapter 17 verse 14, here we see the further revelation of the Lord. These shall make war with the Lamb. That he is the ones who have rejected the Lord. The ones who have rejected the goodness of God and they said, no, we don't want anything to do with the Lord. It's not going to be a master. It's not going to be our Lord. Those ones, they'll war. They, they'll fight against the Lord. And the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Those are the people that ride on white horses and meet from heaven. Those are the people that are made called. They were called to salvation. They responded because of that they were chosen. And then when they were chosen, they came to the kingdom of God. They remained faithful unto the Lord. Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown 
of life. Well, this antagonism, this opposition, this hatred, this strife, this fighting against the Lord, against Christ, against the anointed of the Lord, is that a strange thing? No, not at all. It's not strange. It's something that has been known to God from a long, long time. Look at some tomb and try to capture what the Lord himself had said that uh, these uh, people of the world will do. And yet, uh, the Lord will still be king. Let me read to you from uh, Psalm 2. I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 2, verse 1. What do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That ye shall see that the Almighty God Himself knew this much ahead of time. Before they did it, He knew they would do it, and He got prepared for it. And at the very on the very last day, the day when Christ will come from heaven, when they will gather all their forces together to try to fight against the Lord, this is what the Lord said He will, he will do, saying, "Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us." That's what the unbelievers are saying. That's what the sinners are saying. No, we don't want to submit to the Lord. We don't want to yield to the Lord. Let's break the bands asunder. We don't want to come under his yoke, under his control. And we're going to break his cord upon us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. The Lord is saying that yet he will reign. Yet, my Christ, my anointed one, the Messiah, the Savior, yet you are reign that whatever those kings and rulers of the world, whatever they conspire to do, and whatever they plot to do, that the Lord said, the Almighty God said, yet, in spite of it all, despite it all, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Here the Lord is still saying, mercy is still available. The love of God is still reaching out to you. And the grace of God is still saying, you can come in. You can repent. You can turn. You can have the mercy and the salvation of the Lord. Be wise. Ye kings of the earth, be instructed. Ye judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Trembling. Kiss the son, lest ye be angry and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled, but for a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. We come to, we we'll come back to Revelation chapter nineteen. In Revelation chapter nineteen, uh, we now want to see the latter part, that is the last a few verses there. Revelation chapter nineteen, I'm reading now from verse seventeen, and we're going to see the conclusion of all this. Because, uh, you know, no matter how much you talk about grace, those who will not repent or want to be adamant will say be adamant. And no matter how much love you show, the love of God flowing from Calvary and revealed unto everyone, those who want to rebel will still rebel. And therefore you find this closing part, which is a severe condemnation of the adversaries of Christ the conqueror. In Revelation chapter 19, reading from verse 17, and I saw an angel standing in the sun. It's not talking about standing in the open, open land where the rays of the sun are beating. It's like standing in the sun itself. Uh, that the heat of the sun, as intense as it was, will not be able to burn up that angel. I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls and the, that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may, that ye may eat the flesh of the kings, and the, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that see on them and the flesh of all men both free and bond both small and great uh, here we find uh, the angel announcing that well because these people have rejected grace to the last point and they have rejected love and mercy to the last point there's no mercy for them anymore no grace for them anymore and the love of God has failed to draw them only judgment remains 
And so they are going to be destroyed. They are going to be devastated. Uh, let's look at um, Ezekiel chapter 39. Ezekiel chapter 39. Uh, what's interesting as you study these uh, passages and you flip through the Bible back and forth, Old Testament, New Testament, is to understand that all these things were known even before the time of uh, the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation just brings everything together in a summary. Here is what the Lord has seen. Here is what the Lord has revealed. Here is what the Lord has said. And it's going to come to pass. Ezekiel chapter 39, reading from verse 17. Ezekiel 39, verse 17. And thou son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak unto the fair that foul. And to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come. Gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice, that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat the flesh and drink blood. Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, of bullocks, of, of them, of, and of all them, fatlings of Bishan. And ye shall eat fat till ye be full and drink blood till ye be drunken of my sacrifice which I have sacrificed for you. Thus ye shall be defiled at my table with horses and chariots, with mighty men and with all men of war, says the Lord God. And you see here what the Lord is saying. That, that time is coming. That the judgment will come upon the people that fight against the Lord. And then they will die. Multitudes of them, millions of them. And then the birds of the air will eat them up. We're told in Revelation chapter 16, reading from verse 12. Revelation chapter 16, reading from verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his veil upon the great river Euphrates. And uh, the water thereof was dried up. That the way of the kings of the earth might be prepared. The reason we're reading this is to tell you how these people were able to come from all over. And then they came over to uh, the, the holy city and the holy place that is in Israel to fight against the Lord. Uh, the river will be dried up. They will make a way for their horses and their chariots to come. And then he tells us in verse 13, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the, evil, they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great, of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and he see shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. That's the battle of Armageddon. Maybe you've heard about that before. When the people, the heathens, the pagans, the unbelievers, the rejectors of grace, love, and mercy, when they'll try to fight against the Lord, and then the Lord will conquer them and destroy them. I pray that at that time, you'll not be among the rebels, you'll be among the righteous in Jesus' name. We're told in that same revelation, Revelation chapter 17, reading from verse 8, And the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and shall go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. That is the beast, you know, they will be part of those who will fight against the Lord. Now, you will see that in this Revelation chapter 19, look at it again, Revelation chapter 19, two suppers are spoken of. Uh, you find that uh, one supper, we're told that the marriage supper of the Lamb is come. Look at verse 9. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's one supper. That's for the righteous. That's for the bride of the Lamb. That's for the people of God. That's for the people that, clo that are clothed in, in linen, white and clean. The righteousness of the saints. You know the other supper? The other supper is the great supper of the Lord. Look at verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he, he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of, of heaven. Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Yeah, that's a different kind of supper. That's when there will be, there will be war. 
And then Christ will destroy all his enemies. And their dead bodies will be lying in the open, in the open field. And then the birds of the air will be feasting on them. That's a great supper of the people that are destroyed. The mighty men and the lowly men. Of the people that rebel against the mercy and the goodness of the Lord. And the question is, which supper are you going to take part in? If you're, if you're going to take part in the marriage supper of the Lamb, then you must turn away from your sin. Come to know the Lord as your Lord and savior and then when you are saved you're a real child of god you'll be able to take part in that marriage supper of the lamb but if you miss that supper of the lamb then you'll be supper for the birds of the air for the scavengers that are going to devour the dead bodies of those people rebelling against the lord look at chapter 19 verse 19 and i saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies they gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army that is against christ against the bridegroom and the bride against christ and the people of god in verse 20 and the beast was taken was him was the, and was the false prophet and wrought that wrought miracles before him which it was which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worship his image. And these bulls were cast alive into the lake, into the, into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. That's the end of the beast. That's the end of the false prophet. Both the beast and the false prophet will get into hellfire. They'll go to hellfire alive. How many of them here too? Do you remember how many people have gone to heaven without seeing death? Two of them, Enoch and Elijah. And you see two people that are going to get into hell without uh, even going through death, the false prophet and the antichrist, because he's the beast. And the false prophet cast into the lake of fire. And the remnant in verse 21, the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat on, on the, upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. As we look at those, uh, at that verse 20 in particular, that the beast was cut into, into the lake of fire. And then the false prophet was also cast into the lake of fire. You ask yourself a question. Are there people that, that are like beasts? And if there are people that are like bees, where well, are they going to end up? They're going to end up in hell fire. And the bees and the false prophet. Let me show you in Titus chapter 1 verse 12. Titus chapter 1 verse 12. The people that have beastly character. The character of beasts. The violence of beasts. The ferocity of beasts. And the wickedness of bees. The devouring nature of bees. The destructive nature of bees. And where that beast ascended, that's where they're going to end it. They don't repent. Titus chapter 1 verse 12. Of the, of one of themselves, even a prophet of their own said, The Grecians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. You see, there are people that behave like animals. They destroy. They eat one another. They fight one another. They are filled with violence. We're told in Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, looking at verse 12. And remember, the bees will eventually end up in the lake of fire. And if you have a beastly character, and there is no repentance, a beastly character, and there is no returning from sin, a beastly character, and there is no return from the, wayward, from the waywardness and the wickedness of your life, that beastly character will make you to end up like the beast that was thrown into the lake of fire. It's in Second Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 12. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 12. But these are natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of, of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. And so we understand, except somebody repents, if he keeps the beastly character, eventually the end will be hell fire, the lake of fire. How about the false prophet? The false prophet also was cast in the lake of fire alive. How about the people who are false prophets today? Are there false prophets? So yes, there are. The Lord tells us what their end will be. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 15. Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves, ravaging wolves, destructive. 
uh, wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. He's telling us that the false prophets, what they can only bring forth will be evil fruit, evil character, evil behavior, an evil thought, an evil plan. Evil imagination. That's all they can bring forth. Then he tells us in verse 20, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is seen down and cast into the fire. False prophets, beware of those false prophets because eventually their end and the end of the people following after them will be hell fire. In Second Peter, I'm reading to you from chapter 2. Second Peter, chapter 2, we're reading from verse 1. Second Peter chapter 2, we're looking at verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately, privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. The same end that came upon that false prophet in Revelation chapter 19, that same thing will come upon all the false prophets of every age, of every time, of every land, in every nation. And then it says, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Whose judgment now is of a long time, of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. And so we learn that uh, what happened to that same false prophet and that uh, beast of the of Revelation chapter 19 will happen to all beasts, that is, all people of beastly character, and all people that are false prophets. What are we to do that we may escape the judgment of God, that we will not have the lot of the people of beastly character? I will not have the lot of the people that are false prophets and followers of the false prophets. Here is what we are to do. Number one, repent of all your sins. If you have repented already, I praise the Lord for you. If you came to the Lord during that time of the crusade and you told the Lord, yes, I received the Lord. And you said, yes, Lord, A, I accept. B, I believe. And C, I confess. And I now confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. You have seen a change of life already. If any man be in Christ, a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. No more smoking, no more drinking, and no more, uh, no more fornication, no more adultery, no more hard drugs, no more abominations of evil people, no more idolatry and no more traditions of this world. You are totally changed. You have repented of your sin, of, from your sin. Congratulations. That means you have taken that first step. You have come to know the Lord as your personal Savior. If you are there, you are hearing me today. You have not done that. If you want to escape the judgment of God, there is what to do. Number one, repent of all your sins. Number two, receive the Savior. He's pleading, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He comes, he says, I have the water of life. And I have forgiveness with me. And I have the joy of the Lord to give you, the joy of salvation to give you. I died for you, he said. I'm waiting. I'm knocking at the door. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him and sup with him. Take supper with him. Receive the Savior. And then I'm going to tell you number three is to reconcile with everyone. Reconcile with everyone. You have reconciled with the Lord. Reconcile with your enemies. I'll never greet that person till I die. Hatred will buy you from heaven. Unforgiveness will buy you from heaven. That will debar you from getting to heaven. That hard heart, no, I'll, I'll never do that. I'll never talk to that person. Malice, I'm going to keep that malice with the fellow till I die. Then you want to go to hell. Reconcile with everyone. Husband, you've kicked away your wife. And wife, you've kicked away your husband. Reconcile together. And then come together in fellowship. Is that reconciliation that actually brings you into favor with the Lord? What did Jesus say? You bring your gift to the altar. And there you remember that somebody has sought against you. Then you leave your gift at the altar and you go reconcile with the people that you have those odd things against. Number four, request for sufficient grace. There are challenges that will come your way. There are temptations that will come your way. 
There are trials that will come your way and you need the grace of God to be able to sail through. Request for the grace of God, sufficient grace. And then number five is to remove all stumbling blocks. If you know there are things you've been watching that will make you stumble, remove them. There are people that will be moving ways that will make you stumble, remove them. There are actions that you, you know, people pull you into and then makes you feel guilty and you know that you are not doing the right thing. Remove them. Remove all stumbling blocks. You know, if the alcohol is still in the fridge, the temptation will be there to go back to it. Remove them and throw them away. And if the cigarettes are there, you know, the temptation will be there. It's going to be a stumbling block. Remove it and throw that away. And if you're living with somebody you've not really married, and you know, you say, well, I'm going to control myself. And until we really do the right thing, we're not going to come together. Remove her from yourself. Remove, get yourself away from that man. Otherwise, you're going to fall right back into that sin. Remove all the stumbling blocks. Number six is to remember the promises of scripture. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will strengthen you. And though the people of the world may fight against you, because now you come to know the Lord, and you say, what have you done? Giving your life to the Lord. Going to a Bible-believing church like that. Remember the promises of the Lord. They will fight against you, but they will not conquer. And it says, I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. Therefore, you may boldly say, the Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my strength. And the Lord is my helper. Of whom shall I be afraid? Remember the promises of scripture. And then number seven is to rescue the sinners. There are many sinners that have not repented. You were a sinner before just a few days ago, a few weeks ago. And now you have come to know the Lord. Tell your friends, I've repented. You too can repent. Tell the people around you, I want you to come to the Lord because I came to know the Lord and the joy I feel, the salvation I have, the goodness of the Lord upon my life. He will do the same thing for you. You rescue the people that are perishing in their sin. You remember what you have to do. Number one is to repent. Number two is to receive the salvation of the Lord from the Savior. Number three is to reconcile with everyone you have any, any grudge against. Number four is to request for sufficient grace and the Lord will see you through. Number five is to remove all the stumbling blocks in your way. Don't allow anything that will make you to stumble. Number six is to remember the promises of the scripture. And then number seven is to rescue. Rescue the sinners. In fact, be a soul winner. And be witnessing to other people because the Lord has given you the ministry of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm reading to you from verse 17. And then we're going to read to verse 18 and we're going to read to verse 20. Verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. If you have now come to Christ, if you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you become a new creature. It's a new creature. All things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. In verse 18, all things of God who has reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Once you come to the Lord and you are reconciled with the Lord, he gives you the ministry of reconciliation. In verse 20, now then, we are now ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ said, be ye reconciled to God. Be ye reconciled to God. The Lord is calling every one of us and is saying, take the right step. You know that judgment is coming. And you know that those who are rebellious and adamant in their sins, they're going to perish in their sins. But this is still the day of grace and the day of mercy and the day of love. And you can come to know the Lord today and then you have the salvation of the Lord. And literally you become a child of God as well as a soul winner at the same time. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Now the Lord himself will help us that when the Lord shall come, we'll be among the people of God, among the saints of God, not among the rebels, not among the sinners, not among the people that do not know the Lord, but among the people that know the Lord. Call upon the Lord today and say, Lord, thank you for what I've learned today. And those who have just given their lives to the Lord, this is how we study the Bible. You study the word of God, and then you take those points you had, you take it to the Lord in prayer. You have heard about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming again. He's coming again. That same Jesus, the lamp of God of days gone by, is going to be the lion of the tribe of Jesus. 
Judah. Why don't you thank the Lord that he became the lamb for you. He became the sacrifice for you. He became the savior for you. He granted you the love and the grace and the mercy. And you have received him as your personal savior. He came as a benefit of the first coming. And if you are benefited from the first coming of the Lord, are you not going to benefit from the second coming of the Lord? That the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes to reign as king of kings and lord of laws, you'll be among the saints that will follow after him upon white horses upon victory and the glory of the lord will be yours why don't you tell the lord oh lord i thank you i thank you yes i believe the lord is coming again yes i believe the lord is coming again the one who died for me the one who rose again he is coming again jesus is coming is coming is coming jesus is coming again my heart is so happy and my soul is so glad for jesus is coming again you tell the lord you want to be among the saints you want to be among the people of god when the lord himself shall re when he shall return to take it when it shall return and so that it will judge this world you would have gone in the rapture you would have gone in rapture if you are saved if you are sanctified if you are holy if you are righteous if your life is filled with the grace of god you tell the lord keep me faithful until that time oh lord keep me faithful until that time I don't want to perish with the people of the world. I don't want to perish with the people that are heathens. I don't want to perish with the people that do not know the Lord. I want to be with the people that know the Lord. Righteous, pure, holy, waiting for the coming of the Lord. Are you not happy that Jesus Christ, the conqueror, is your Lord? Jesus Christ, the conqueror, is your Savior. Jesus Christ, the conqueror, is your Master. And you see His majesty. And you see his glory. And you see his power. And you see in the beauty of his life, the honor, the exaltation. And he's coming again. And he's coming again. You tell the Lord, yes, I believe that the Lord is coming again. He's a faithful one. He's a true one. And he said, he's coming and I believe he's coming. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are coming. And then you'll be doing everything to get ready for the coming of the Lord. You'll be doing everything to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Yes, it's coming. Yes, it's coming. It's coming will be visible. It will be majestic. It will be glorious. It will come in glory. It will come in power. Thank you, Lord, because you are teaching me this. Thank you, Lord, because you are revealing all this to me. And if you're a new believer, you're a new Christian, you're hearing that the Lord is coming. Yes, he's coming. He's coming again. He's coming again. Believe it and then live your life in readiness for the coming of the Lord. He's coming. He's coming. You're so glad. You're so happy because he's coming. And then you are rejoicing the Lord because you know that the Lord Jesus is coming again. What, what will it take to be ready? You must have repented of your sin. Don't allow any sin to remain because any little sin, any single sin can hinder you from, come, from seeing the Lord on the final day. For the peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. As now the Lord has changed your life and the Lord has turned you around and the Lord has washed you in his, in his precious blood that makes you clean and white and pure. You tell the Lord, oh Lord, keep me pure. Waiting for the coming of the Lord. Keep me pure, Lord. Waiting for the coming of the Lord. Because it will take that purity. It will take that cleanliness. It will take that righteousness. If you are going to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Everyone that has this hope in him. Purify himself. Even as he is pure. Everyone, everyone, everyone that has this hope in him, purifies himself, even as he is pure. If you have hope of seeing the Lord on that final day, you have the hope of going with the Lord on that final day, you have the hope that you don't want to miss the rapture on that final day, then you are going to remain pure and righteous. You are going to remain holy and clean in the sight of the Lord. In your heart, holy and pure. In your mind, holy and pure. In your lifestyle, holy and pure. In your behavior, character, holy and pure. In your relationship with your husband, with your wife, with neighbors, with friends, in the neighborhood, holy and pure. There will be no lying. There will be no deception. There will be no evil. There will be no anger. There will be no violence. There will be no fighting. There will be no malice. Tell the Lord to grant you the grace. That's why we came to the Bible study. We study the Bible and then we pray it in. We pray it in so that we can receive everything the Lord wants to give us of his grace, of his strength, of his power. So that we will be the kind of people he wants us to be and then we'll be ready when the Lord will come. We'll be ready when the Lord will come. We'll be ready when the Lord will come. The Lord is coming again. 
The Lord is coming again. Be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And let him give you the life that is glorifying unto the Lord. The life that is glorifying unto the Lord. He will do it. He will do it. Because he's interested that you are holy. He's interested that you are righteous. He's interested that you are ready for the coming of the Lord. When he comes, he comes like a flame of fire. He comes in power and great glory. And you're saying, oh Lord, keep me ready. Keep me ready. If you reject the mercy of the Lord, what are you going to do when he comes with devastating judgment? If you reject the love of God, when you, what are you going to do when he comes and he treads the wine press of the wrath and the anger and the judgment of God? This is the day of mercy. That's why you're saying, Lord, I need the mercy today. I need the grace today. I need the love today. I need the power today. I need the strength today that you help me to live a righteous life and overcome my temptation. Overcome all the evil things. Overcome everything that will militate against my standing firm. Firm unto the end. Let the Lord do it in your life. Yes, he will do it. Yes, he will do it. If you will call upon the Lord, if you will call upon the Lord, you remember you ought to repent of your sins if you have not repented. Repent of every form of sin. If you have not repented and say, Lord, I know that if I call upon you, you are going to answer. He has commanded all men everywhere to repent. That's how to be ready for the coming of the Lord. He has commanded all men everywhere to repent. And then you receive the Savior. He's waiting. He's knocking at the door. He's saying, yes, I'm hearing your prayer. Yes, I'm hearing that you need forgiveness. Yes, I'm hearing that you need my strength. Yes, I'm hearing that you need the, the power of the Lord to keep you steady and keep you stable and keep you steadfast. I will give it to you. Receive it by faith. Accept. You have come here. You have studied the word of God so you can be strengthened and strong in the Lord. It will make you strong. And then you promise the Lord if you are fighting with anybody, you go and reconcile. If you have some row, some uh, conflict with your wife, your husband, you go and reconcile. If you have some row, some conflict with your children, with your parents, you go and reconcile. If you have some conflict and some disagreement with, you know, your friends and co-workers or your employee, your employer, you go and reconcile. Because if we're children of God, there must be reconciliation with the righteousness. When you have come to know the Lord, there will be that reconciliation. You tell the Lord, oh Lord, thank you, thank you. You have given me the grace. I will reconcile. I will reconcile. And my life will not be a life of love, a life of grace, a life of being merciful, a life of being righteous, a life of knowing the Lord, a life of following after the Lord. Request for sufficient grace. He'll give you. Make your request for sufficient grace. He'll give you. Let's come boldly to the throne of grace. It's not the throne of judgment here. The throne of grace that we may receive abundant grace to help in the time of need. He'll do it for you. He'll do it for you. And then he'll qualify you to be part of the people of God. And then you'll take part in that marriage supper of the Lamb. And get grace from the Lord. Grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. Grace upon grace is able to give. The grace to overcome temptation. The grace to overcome every challenge of your life. The grace to stand faithful and true to the Lord. The grace to be able to walk through, walk through life uh, without a uh, turning back, without backsliding. Request grace from the Lord. But if there's any stumbling block in your family, any stumbling block in your life, any stumbling block in your place of work, any stumbling block in, you know, some things to watch and some things to read, remove them. Remove them. All those uh, stumbling blocks, just throw them away. Magical acts, burn them up. Magical books, burn them up. Everything that you know will get you back into evil again, burn them up. A sin partner, a girl that have been pushing you into sin, a man that have been leading you into sin, cut off from them. Remove all the stumbling blocks. That's how you are going to be victorious. So that when the Lord will come, you'll be ready for the coming of the Lord. You promise the Lord, oh Lord, when I live here today, all those stumbling blocks that have been making me to fall into sin, fall into evil, fall in my weaknesses, I'm going to remove them today. Remove all those stumbling blocks. I remember the promises of the Lord. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember the promises of the scripture that when you pray, it will answer you. It will strengthen you. It will make you strong. It will make you to stand firm. It will make you to be the kind of Christian you ought to be. Pure and righteous and knowing the Lord. Yes, I will do it. Remember the promises of the Lord. And as the Lord has saved you, then you become an instrument of salvation for all the people. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. 
Snatch them in pity from Satan's hand. Have compassion on them. And say, yes, Lord, I give myself. I will be a soul winner. I will tell other people how did you can be saved. How did you can know the Lord. Tell other people. Tell other people. Tell other people. And that you, as you are telling other people that they should be able to be saved, then your own experience of salvation will be more firm. You'll be more solid in the things of God, in the way of the Lord, when you rescue the other sinners. And you're telling them, this is where I got saved. I realized I was a sinner. I confess my sins to the Lord. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. My sins are forgiven. I'm a child of God now. And then you pray with them. Lead them to repentance and to receive salvation from the Lord. And then you will find that it will strengthen you in your newfound faith. You have been an old believer. You have been worshipping the Lord for a long time. Even these things are still important for you too. Reconciliation, righteousness, restoration, restitution, and redemption. And then rescuing the perishing. All those things are very important for every one of us. Tell the Lord today and promise the Lord. Oh Lord, I'm going to serve you to the very end. I'm going to serve you to the very end. And I will not allow anything to draw me back. And then be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Be cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. So when the Lord will come, when the Lord will come, he will, make, he will make you ready at that time. Yes, he'll make you ready. Yes, he'll make you ready. Yes, he'll make you ready. Just tell the Lord, oh Lord, here am I. I yield myself. I give myself completely unto you. And I will not allow anything, anything whatever, anything whatever uh, to drag me back to the world again. The Lord is coming. Number one is coming in the rapture to take the saints away. After the great tribulation, they will be coming, returning the second coming to bring judgment upon this world. And then it will rain. And the believers, the righteous people, saved and sanctified people, they reign with him.